Well, today I get to start a new series. I'm excited. Uh, I'm calling it Seeing. Yeah, boy, we need to adjust that, don't we? Seeing stars from prison bars. Seeing stars from prison bars. It's it's a a title that I got from a little couplet I read years ago by the famous inspirational writer James Allen, who wrote, Two men sat behind prison bars. One saw mud, the other saw stars. Perspective. So I'm going to be going through the book of Philippians. I, I love the book of Philippians. One of the reasons is, it, is because it's been called the epistle or the letter of joy. So it's full of joy, and it talks about joy and how to have joy even in worst circumstances of life. Now, sometimes we find ourselves in a prison, a prison of either our problems or our attitude or our habits, or prison of painful event that happened to us in the past. And we kind of live our lives in this prison, defining our life by those problems, or hurts, or habits, or hang-ups in our lives. And we can either look through those prison bars and see mud, focus on the difficult times, the bad thing, or we can look through those prison bars and see stars, see the possibility that God has for us. Now, we've all had bad days. You know you've had a bad day when you call your answer machine and it says it's none of your business what's on the answer machine. You know you've had a bad day when your horn gets stuck on the freeway and you're behind a bunch of hell's angels on a motorcycle. Bad day. You know you have had a, had a bad day when you call the suicide prevention and they put you on hold. You're not very important. Go ahead and shoot yourself. You know you've had a bad day when your birthday cake collapses from the weight of the candle. Yeah. I'm getting old. <laughs> you know you have a bad day when you turn on the evening news and they're showing the emergency routes out of the city chaos. You know you've had a bad day when it cost more to fill up your car than it did to buy it. You know you had a bad day when the bird singing outside your window is a vulture. <gasps> you know you had a bad day when income tax checks is check bounces. The government finally spit themselves into oblivion. Maybe that's not a bad day. Anyway. We've all had horrible times, so what do you do? Uh, there, there's this false conception that if you become a follower of Jesus, then you won't have any bad times. Have you ever heard that? If you're really a believer, then you're going to have smooth sailing, and there aren't going to be any more problems, no more difficulty. The problem with that is it's not true. We're going to have problems. And we're going to find out later that the Apostle Paul who wrote this letter to the Philippians, the Christians in the city of Philippi, that Greek city, was thrown into jail for preaching the good news about Jesus. And Paul was never happier than he was able to preach about the life-changing power that God gives when people commit their lives to him. So Paul wrote this letter to the Philippians when he was also in prison in Rome. Here he is, he's, he's chained to a soldier in the city of Rome, a Roman soldier. And, and he could have looked back and said, this is horrible, all the things that happened. But he chose to smile, even though he's in the middle of the storm. So let's stand together in honor of God's word, and let's read Philippians 1, verses 1 through 11, so we can learn how to smile even in the storm. This letter is from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. I'm writing to all God's holy people in Philippi who belong to Christ Jesus, including the church leaders and deacons. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God 
Whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So it is right that I should feel as I do about all of you, for you have a special place in my heart. You share with me the special favor of God, both in my imprisonment and in defending and confirming the truth of the good news. God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Christ Jesus. I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you'll keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters, so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced by your life in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. Father, we thank you for bringing us together. We thank you for your liberating word, your life-changing word. Help us today to learn how we can smile during the storms in our lives. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, the Apostle Paul, as we said, was in prison. He was suffering. He, he was in, in, in difficult situation. He'd been beat. But he was not complaining. He was not moaning. He was, didn't have an attitude. Instead, he had an attitude full of joy. This, of course, entire letter is about choosing to rejoice, receiving God's joy. Now, the three things that will help you to smile during the storm. The first thing is remember the positive. Remember the positive. In 1 Corinthians 1, 13, it says, I thank my God every time I remember you. Two things that will help you to be positive, and those two things are, first of all, minimize your failures. Minimize your failures. That will help you to remember the positive. Now, Paul, as we've already said, faced tough times in Philippi, and he made his share of mistakes, and he had failures. Ten years earlier, when he's in Philippi, he's writing this letter about his ten year earlier time. He's there with Silas, his ministry partner. And they had some real problems. There was this girl who was demon-possessed, and when Paul and Silas meet, met her and discovered she was possessed by a demon, then Paul cast out the demon from her. Well, that was a good thing, and it was a bad thing. It was a good thing because she was, of course, released from this demon. The bad thing is that she had controllers. She had handlers. She had evil men who were in control of her life. And because she was demon-possessed, these demons gave her this kind of a fortune-telling thing where she could tell this person, this is going to happen to you. they pay money to get their fortune told. And so, of course, these handlers were raking in the money. They were making big-time money off of this demon-possessed girl being able to tell fortune. So they were not happy. When the demon was, was released from her, they were, they were really upset. They were so mad that they organized a mob of people to go attack Paul and Silas in public. And this mob got so frenzied that they tore off the coats, the outer garments of Paul and Silas, and there they are with bare backs and they beat them mercilessly to where their backs are bleeding. They're in a horrible situation. Then they, of course, took them, dragged them to the magistrate. They sentenced them, threw them into jail, put their hands in, in, in stocks, I mean in shackles, and their, their feet in stocks. There they were and chained up in this horrible prison there. It was in the side of a, of, of a hill, really, is what it was, kind of a dungeon. And so, obviously, life wasn't good. It was, it was not pleasant. But it's in those kind of settings 
that the Apostle Paul said this, Philippians 1, 3, I thank God every time I remember you. So what do you focus on when you remember things? Oh, it's horrible. It's the worst time of my life. Oh, I, I will never forget what he or she said to me. I'll never forget what he or she did to me. It was, it was beyond bad. It was evil. So you can just take those bad memories and hug them to you and make your life defined by the bad things that happen to you. But Paul said, no, I'm not going to do that. Had all kinds of bad things, but I'm not remembering those bad things. I thank God every time I remember you. I remember the good things that God did. I, th I remember the good things that happened in your life and through your life. So you have a choice. Remember the bad or remember the good. I like what Billy Graham said in one of his books. He said, there is healing power in a selective memory. As humans, we cannot forget our sins and hurt. But through forgiveness, we can choose not to remember them. One of the beautiful things about our mind is that we can use selective memories to forget the bad things and remember the good things. Paul could have said, hey, I was beaten, I was thrown in jail, but he didn't focus on those things. He focused on the good things. Later on in this letter to the Philippians, verse 8 of chapter 4. The Bible says, Whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, anything that's excellent and praiseworthy, think about those things. Woo! That's your assignment for today and for this week. Amen. Philippians 4, 8. Think about those things. The Apostle Paul had a, was a positive person. Do you like to be around positive people? I love to be around positive people. And it's a real dread to be around negative people. You know, this is bad and that's bad and something else is bad. I had a call from a friend of mine. I've known him for oh, at least 10 years. And he's a, he's a good Christian guy. Uh, he's kind of a puddle glum. You remember the cartoon with the character Puddle Glum? Who's the guy on Sesame Street who's like Puddle Glum? Oscar Grouch. Yeah, Oscar the Grouch? Is that his name? Some good. Yeah, okay. Well, Puddle Glum's only going to. He's always glum, glum. Well, kind of, this friend of mine kind of has this puddle glum spirit, even though he's a follower of Christ. And there's one guy that we have a mutual, we know he, this one guy. Both know this one guy. And this guy has his issues. And he's kind of hard to hang around because it's all about me. He's one of those guys. And, and, and he's got a lot of money, so he's always, you know, it's, it's just like he can control things. If you, if you didn't have money, you couldn't do it. So he will, this friend of mine, this other friend, he, he will call me up every so often, and he'll start ranting about this guy. And he's done this, oh, several times through the year. And I'll listen, and I won't say much except... You know, I try to be positive and nice. Well, he called me this time, I think it was yesterday. And he said, and he, he wanted to apologize. I, said, I think this is the second time he apologized for talking bad about this guy. 
People like that, they just sap the juice out of them. You know, some people see the glass as half empty. But positive people see the glass as half full. Some people say the sky is partly cloudy. Positive people say the sky is partly sunny. Some people see a problem in every opportunity, but positive people see an opportunity in every problem. If you look through the history of, of the world, the greatest people were positive people. The most successful people, or like Paul, they were positive people. I don't know if you know that there's a tunnel underneath the English Channel. Are you aware of that? There's a tunnel underneath the English Channel between England and France. It was first proposed, there it is, it was first proposed in 1802. But it wasn't until 1988 that they finally began to dig the tunnel. And in 94, it was completed. In 93, it was completed. In 94, they started the service between England and France, France and England. There were actually three tunnels, uh, two for trains that go back and forth. And the middle tunnel is a service tunnel that can access and, and maintain those other two tunnels. Well, they call the tunnel Channel. That's, that's the name. Several years ago, there's a New York contractor in New York, in New York, upstate New York, whose name is Mendel Polestoker. He submitted a bid to drill that tunnel, and, and his bid was accepted. And the minute he did that, so many people came out of the woodwork and said, it can't be done. They said all kind of negative things. It's an engineering nightmare. In fact, Civil engineers came to him and asked, and said, how are you going to do it? And Mendel says, I'm going, to, I'm going to start digging on the English side, and my son Howard is going to start digging on the French side, and then we're going to dig until we meet. And one of the en engineers said, well, did you know that plotting directions underground is one of the most difficult engineer nightmares that there are? What are you going to do if you do not meet? I love his response. Such a positive person. He said, if we do not meet, big deal. He said, if we don't meet, we'll just both keep digging, and my client will simply get two tunnels for the price of one. Do you love that? I like that kind of attitude. Well, that's the attitude that, that the Apostle Paul had. His enemy said, Paul, you're going to die. And, and Paul said, big deal. If I live, I have Christ. If I die, I gain Christ for eternity. Paul was so energetic and so positive. He's one of these guys that, that you could walk into a revolving door in front of him, and you'd walk out, and he'd walk out in front of you on the other side. Positive and full of energy. All of us may have made mistakes, and most of us have blown big time. But a positive person is going to go through life living the best life possible regardless of mistakes. Here's the second thing we do, need to do if we're going to remember the positive. We need to maximize your friends. Maximize your friends. In Philippians 1.5, the Bible says, you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. The Apostle Paul is saying that the thing that keeps me smiling is remembering you as partners of mine. And then in uh, Philippians 4, 16 through 18, it tells us the kinds of friends that Paul was talking about. Uh, verse 16, even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent help more than once. I didn't say this because I want a gift from you. Rather, I want you to receive a reward for your kindness. At the moment, I have all I need and more. I am generously supplied with the gifts you sent to me from or with Ephroditus. They are sweet-smelling sacrifice. They're acceptable and pleasing to God. So the Apostle Paul is writing back to this church that he'd been at 10 years before, and he, he's reminding them of the faithfulness and how encouraging it was to him. So when you're going through tough times, maximize your friends. Do you know the difference between a friend and acquaintance?
When everything is going well in your life, you're going to have a lot of acquaintances. And when you've just hit the skids, you'll find out who your true friends are. You ever had tough times? Any better? And there was somebody you thought was your best friend? And they either turn on you, or when the bad talk goes, they're just quiet. You don't have to do anything bad. Just, you could just be quiet, not supportive. That's a difference between friends and acquaintances. The Apostle Paul said to the followers of Christ in Philippi, of all the other churches I've ministered to, you guys are the ones who have supported me. And I thank you for that. Some of you are in tough times here. Going through this storm, if you'll think positively, you can minimize your failures and connect and be grateful for your friends. Because the second thing you need to do, we need to learn. Rejoice in prayer. We need to rejoice in prayer. The Bible says in, in Philippians 1, 4, in all our, my prayers for you, for all of you, I always pray with joy. So if you, if you feel like you're imprisoned in a problem, then remember the, the, the past positively and then pray. Now, there's all kinds of things we can do after we pray but there's nothing we, we can do until we pray. So how do you start every project? How do you address every problem? What's the first thing you do? The Bible tells us the first thing we do is bring it to God. God, here's this problem, here's this issue, here's this thing, here's this stuff I, I, you know, that needs to be accomplished. God, would you give me insight? God, would you help me? But what we so many times do is, well, okay, I think we can do this, and we make all these plans, and, and then when it doesn't work out, we say, oh, I guess the only thing we can do now is pray. You know, that's what we should do to begin with. First thing we need to do is pray. Make a choice to rejoice. Philippians 4, 4, the Bible says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. So let me ask you, are you rejoicing in your difficulty? If you have any difficulty, do you rejoice? I'm so thankful to God that, that he's taught me this. When I pray, I used to, it wasn't a prayer. It used to be a great time, you know? Oh, God, this is not good, and they're not good, and that's not working, and this, you know, just a litany of stuff that wasn't any good. Now when I pray, I thank God for this person, this situation, that thing. Because this thing was hard, but you taught me this. And this person was difficult, but you, you led me in this area. You, you were refining me. So I thank God. You may be saying, Mark, you don't know all the problems I have. You're telling me to rejoice? You don't know the bad things. I'm not telling you to rejoice. God is. He inspired the apostle. Paul, he said, rejoice in the Lord. Remember, he's in prison. He's changed his Roman soldier, and he's waiting to have his head cut off. Now, let me ask you. Anybody in that situation? Is, are your times that tough? You're in prison. You're chained to some soldier, and you're waiting to have your head cop, chopped off? That's where Paul was when he wrote this letter. He said, Rejoice! Be glad. Smiles are just like rejoicing. They're contagious. If you find somebody without a smile today or this week, then I recommend you give them yours. And when you give them your smile, they not only have your smile, but you have your smile too. Smiles are contagious. You know, people notice you when you're in a tough situation and you're smiling 
and you're rejoicing and you're positive. Because you go, wow, this guy's in, I don't get it. Because everybody and his brother acts like when his things are tough, they act like it. Right? But when you're joyful and smiling and, and happy, you know the problem with too many Christians? is that we look like we've been vaccinated with vinegar. Well, Paul and Silas were beaten, imprisoned. Their hands were bound. Their feet were bound. They're in this dungeon. And they began to sing. It's about midnight, the Bible says. And they, they began to sing praises to God. Now, I guarantee you, when you're in that situation, think about Paul and Silas. You're back to, or like human hamburger from being beaten. And, and you're in stock. You, you're in chains. You can't move around. You're in this cold, damp place in this dungeon. And, and, and people have been yelling and screaming at you, and, and, and you're exhausted, and you probably hadn't eaten for a long time, and you don't have any water, and you're in a tough situation. They did not feel like singing. They did not feel like rejoicing, but they did anyway. In the middle of that time, Acts 16, 25 says, the other prisoners were listening to them. You see, they didn't just sing that, but the other prisoners were listening to them. I, I, I would put money on it that if you go to heaven, you would find other prisoners in that prison with Paul and Silas because they'd go, wow! Yeah. You know, that, those guys were not in any place to sing, but they were singing praises to God. They'd go, I want that kind of joy! Yeah. They received Christ. The Bible says in John 16, 33, the Bible says, I have told you these things, so, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. Here's the second thing, the content of the request. Paul prayed a very specific prayer. I call it the content of the request. He prayed for three things. In verse 9 of chapter 1, Philippians, I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. First of all, he said, pray for love. He said, love each other, that your love will overflow. Love each other. Love is the only sign of a Christian. It's not what you do or don't do. It's do you love people? Do you care for people? Do you love your brothers and sisters? Now, the question is, do you love everybody in this group? Now, what is love? Love is a commitment to do the best thing for that person. And you, you're cheering for them. You're rooting for them. You want the best for them. Do you love? Do you really love believers? 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 5 says, Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. It keeps us no record of wrong. The second thing that God inspired Paul to pray for was purity. First of all, he inspired them to pray for love, and they said for, pray for purity. Now, purity uh, literally means tested by the sun. This word purity is, is a, a combination of two, uh, two words, Latin word, sia, or sign, pronounced either way, and sira. So, sia, or sign, means without, and sira means wax. Now, in the Bible times, when a potter would create a pot, put the clay on a, 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 on, a, on a spinning wheel and create that pot. In the process of doing that, sometimes there would be pieces that would break off or there would be cracks in that pot. And so if that happened, some of the potters would take wax and fill in that crack or put the piece back together and kind of glue it with this wax so that when it was set out in the sun and got hot enough, the wax would melt. And you could see the air. Suppose the heat would fall apart. So when you were shopping for pottery, you needed to know 
if that pottery had any wax in it. So pots that had no cracks and had no wax were advertised with a sign, see Sarah. This pot has no wax. It has no crack. Paul is praying that we will have that same kind of purity, that we'll be sincere. God doesn't want to be fake or artificial. God wants to be sincere and pure. He didn't talk about putting on a plastic smile. Have you ever done that? You're feeling like crud, and you go to church, you go, ah! I didn't want you to be fake. The third thing inspired uh, to pray for was fruit. Philippians 1, 11, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ. Love and purity go together. We're supposed to be pure, we're supposed to be sincere. How can you tell if a Christian is sincere or not? Well, Matthew 7, 16 says, you can identify them by the fruit, that is, by the way they act. That's what Jesus said. So what is the fruit of a Christian? The fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Galatians 5, 22, and first, the last two words of verse 23. How can you tell if a Christian is real, a person is real? Are they filled with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness? If I don't see it, can't remember it and all the other attributes of love. You can say 3,000 years ago, 50 years ago, 5 years ago, yesterday, I prayed to receive Christ. But if you're acting without love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and all those attributes, you're not sincere. What Jesus said. You can walk around saying, yeah. But your life demonstrates whether you're real or fake. Do you have a list of people? I don't like this guy. I don't like this guy. I don't, you know, if that guy died, I'd be happy. If something bad happened to them, they deserve it. That goes on and on. You need to take those thoughts to God. Say, God, help them. Help them see them like you see them. Love them like you see them. Jesus said in John 15, 1, I am the true vine, but the Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Then he says something pretty tough. 15, 2, John 15, 2. Every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Have you ever been pruned by God? I have. The painful process. But the only reason God prunes us is to make us more fruitful, more like Jesus, more productive, more loving, more forgiving, more kind, more full of the fruit of the Spirit. Third way we can keep smiling during the storms is to recognize the potential. Philippians 1, 6, He who began a good work in you will carry it out to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. The first thing we, knew, we need to learn is to see the problem from God's perspective. The apostle said, I'm in prison, I'm suffering. I'd rather preach the gospel. But I want to see the problem from God's perspective. God's looking at it differently than me. Romans 5, 28 says, and we know that in all things God works for the good for those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. The second thing we need to see is the process from God's intention. We see it from God's perspective, second from his intention. Philippians 1, 6, he who began a good work in you will continue into this work until it is finally finished on the day Christ Jesus returns. God commenced it, God continues it, God completes it. As long as we submit our lives to God, he will complete the process of making us like Jesus. 
as a children's song a long time ago. Some of you may remember it. He's still working on me. Make me what I need to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and stars, the sun and earth and Jupiter and Mars. Loving and faith, patient he must be, as he's still working on me. Anybody here perfect? No. I'm not. Jesus is the only perfect. That's why he's working on us. It's a painful process to be molded in the image of Christ. But it's worth it because you end up with a beautiful life. If you're hurting or suffering for one reason or another, it could be that God is working special things in your life, making you like Jesus. A man and woman entered this china shop in England, and this man noticed this teacup sitting on the shelf, and he asked if he'd look at it. He said, I've never seen anything like it. It's so beautiful, that teacup. And suddenly the teacup spoke. You don't understand. I haven't always been a teacup. There was a time when I was nothing but red clay. My master rolled and kneaded and pounded me over and over, and I yelled, leave me alone! But he only smiled and said, not yet. Then I was placed on a spinning wheel, the teacup said. Suddenly, I was spun around and around and around. Stop it, I yelled. I'm getting dizzy. The master only nodded and said, not yet. Then he put me on, in an oven. I had never felt such heat. It felt like I was living in Odessa. <laughs> he didn't really say that. I wonder why he wanted. I wonder why he wanted to burn me. The teacup said. And I yelled and knocked on the door. I could see him through the opening. I read his lips. He shook his head and said, <laughs> "Finally, the door didn't open." He put me on the shelf and I began to cool down. There, that's better, I said. And suddenly he took me and braced me and painted me all over. The fumes were horrible. I thought I would gag. Stop it. Stop it, I cried. He said, not yet. And suddenly he put me back in the oven. Not the first one, but twice as hot. The second oven. I knew I would suffocate. I begged, I pleaded, I screamed, I cried. All the time I could see him through the opening. Nodding his head, he said, not yet. I knew there would be no hope and I would never make it. I was ready to give up, but the door opened and took me out and placed me on the shelf. And an hour later, he handed me a mirror and said, look at yourself. I did. I said, that's not me. It couldn't be. I'm beautiful. He said, I want you to remember, I know it hurt to be rolled and pounded, but if I'd left you, it would have dried up. I know it hurt and was hot and disagreeable in the oven, but if I hadn't put you there, you would have cracked. I know the fumes are bad when I braced, braced you and painted you all over, but if I didn't, you would have never hardened there would have been no color to your life. And if I hadn't put you back in the oven a second time, you would not have survived very long, and the hardness would not have held. Now you are a finished product. You're what I had in mind when I first began with you. God is conforming us to the image of Christ. If we'll submit, will be beautiful as a result. Put your belly here.